In the dull evening twilight, I could barely make out my horse forehoof as it sat gently upon my mother's smooth coat. Even so, the shafts of light which permeated the jagged roof of the train car provided enough illumination for me to make out the deep blue hue of my mother's height as it shifted. I think I felt something. I laughed giddily as her small on this section kicked. And known for a few weeks now. Ever since she'd accidentally spilled it to me while on another angry tantrum about how my friends were a bad influence on me. Yeah, I'm sure they were not perfect, but the older unicorns were teaching me some neat stuff. Not to mention they told me how to take care of Zap. Unfortunately, my mother had drawn the line last week when we accidentally found ourselves too close to some radiation pit at the back of the town. We should have been back there, she said. They're a bad influence on the young filly like you. Firstly, I wasn't a filly. I was 12, and while I still didn't have my uni mark, I could definitely look after myself. I mean, I didn't even get close to the glowing barrel, so there was no way I could have done anything to me. Especially the amount of right away she had forced me to take afterward. Even so, I was condemned to stay here in this tin can of a car unless supervised. No matter how much I protested or begged. And admittedly, after the first few failed escape attempts, I just accepted it. All the while, I continually told myself that she was the only pony I'd been th be this nice to. I mean, after the misunderstanding with Dodge, I'd feel I was being uh, too little hard on her. Especially when she had a new fool to think about. It was really funny. I sort of had an idea of where foals came from before this. But my mother had never had a stallion, not outside of work anyway, and traveling about so much so that even the relationships with them were fleeing. I'll admit, it was embarrassing to think that I might have ended up like her. That was if I had not actually done anything, my thoughts added. I was still trying to convince every pony that, well, I knew that I may be reckless, I wasn't that stupid. <sighs> yes, dear. They're now one for sleeping. Please do me a favor and just get yourself some sleep. My mother groaned wearily, rubbing her scrubbing belly with a hoof. I looked around at her, her forehoof still rubbing the smooth surface of her stomach. But mom, I want to talk to my new baby brother. I protested, forcing my voice into a fake whine. The blue unicorn smiled warmly, as if she couldn't resist. You do know this fool could be Philly, right? My, she asked me casually as I felt another kick beneath my hoof. I thought about that for a moment, but my mind wasn't one for focusing on one thing for too long. Nah, he's gonna be cold. I can tell. If he were a filly, he'd be like me, and I can kick way harder than that. I stated proudly, puffing up my chest. My mother rolled her eyes. Don't I know it, she replied, then sighed. My look turned somewhat curious. I could imagine how I felt to have some pony moving about inside you. Then again, I wasn't getting in line to find out. I mean, I love my mom and all, but this... She was kind of a bitch while pregnant. She looked at me casually before shaking her head slowly, laughing to herself subtly. My ears perked, my head cocking to one side, and an eyebrow rose in confusion. Was this mo another mood swing? She'd been telling me to go to bed a moment ago. Now she seemed okay with me just sitting her here prodding her. I was a uh, craving. She had already sent me to get her ten packs of sugar apple bombs this week. By Celestia, she was going to be a pain while we had to move again. Mom, you okay? Asked skeptically, like I was still struggling her coat almost subconsciously. She gave another thoughtful laugh before looking back up at me. All right, they're no better than you, she said, rubbing her hoof in my scruffy mane. My concern washed away. Why was I worried anyway? She'd been through this alone with me after all. It gave her an appreciative smile. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm just glad I never had to put up with some pony kicking about inside me, I boasted cheerfully. With that, my mom stopped ruffling my mane and instead moved her hoof to mine, gliding across her belly gently. I looked at her curiously for a moment. Her focus was on where her hose fell upon her swollen stomach. Oh? 
she asked knowingly, not sparing me a glance. What do you mean, oh? Have you seen what this thing is doing to you? I exclaimed bluntly. She, she just gave another sweet chuckle. You know, what do you mean not say that? She said, her tone one of motherly amusement. No, I think I'll, that I'll leave that to you, I laughed, as her host stopped on the rising bulge. There he is, I can feel him. I looked up to my mother eagerly to find her once again shaking her head. Her smiling expression somewhat marginally. Yep, that's where he likes to lie. Right in the ribs. She grinned as she pat an extra emphasis on the irritated tone of the voice of her latter statement. My attention was far too occupied with the soft mass beneath my mother's smooth coat, however. My brother, I was going to have a baby brother, or maybe a sister, but I was convinced it would be a brother. Mom, I'm going to be the best big sister ever, you'll see, I declared proudly, looking up at her with an equally wide smile. She paused looking at me with motherly affection. I'm sure you will, she said, rubbing the same spot with her hoof. I'm sure you will, she repeated to herself thoughtfully. You'll make a great mom too, she added. As of teasing, I mean, you're reckless, disobedient, and the like, she added jokingly. My eyes narrowed as a whimsical scowl adorned my face. But you're loyal and caring, but your heart is always in the right place, she added with pride. Yeah, it's in my chest, I snarked wittily, pointing a hoof to the same spot on my body. But I'm still fine with leaving this mushy stuff to you. She shook her head once more. It was like somehow she thought I believed it was her job to have every fool in the wasteland. I mean, come on, that was a stupid idea, right? It's ju not just about this. You know, Astral. There's a lot more to it. Like love. She replied. My ears purred curiously, with my eyebrows rising. But you didn't love any pony. Certainly not any of those stallions you had back there. I mean, you were kicking them out the next morning. I told her giddily, waving a hoof to the door. She paused for a moment, blushing slightly. Her crystal blue eyes looked as if they were staring right through me. Then she sighed. No, I loved you more than any pony. She played with a warm grin. And I smirked challengingly. Even more than him? I countered, rubbing her belly softly. She laughed slightly as her her as my hoof returned to the squirming mass of full within her. Well, maybe you'll have some competition soon, she corrected. I spat out my tongue in playful disgust. I was certainly wasn't getting in line to go through this lovey dovey crap. You know, you need some sleep, she swiftly added, looking to my bed on the opposite side of the train car. I glanced in the direction of the ragged pile atop the mattress. But mom, I lied, hoping it would provide me with the same response as my former attempt. I saw her roll, eyes roll tersomely. No, astral fire. Go to bed. This fool isn't going anywhere for a few months yet, she told me wearily. I was about to protest. If you're recalling what I told myself about being somewhat of a jerk, I guess I gave in with a frustrated huff. Good night, little bro. I said reluctantly, before hesitatingly pulling my hoof from my mother's belly and trudged over to my bed. Oh well, at least I could actually get some sleep without a party going on inside me. I thought I would in glee. The idea of silent from, from a realization. Not that I'd ever have to worry about, yet the more I thought about what my mother had said, the more I began to wonder. What more was there to it? The idea of not knowing was strangely particular. Almost like my curiosity was instinctive. Yeah, I assured myself having some pony inside me was just weird. Besides, I didn't want to get that fat. I list all my cold friends at for sure if I was that fat. Yep, I, it was probably for the best, I mentally repeated as I settled down into my bed. Well, you seem to be fine, Bone Meal said flatly, tapping on the flickering medical screen with a hoof. That was a familiar sight for me. The clinic, that is. I usually find myself in Morrow's back in churn, and she had almost everything except one of those autodoc things I'd heard so much about. I never really paid much attention 
to the stories about the small iron coffins with cutting arms, syringes, saws, and lasers ready to take a bunny apart. To me, it sounded like a stable, only a miniaturized. I much prefer the more open approach of a clinic, even if needles were one of the only things I was still terrified of. I know, I know, I was such a foolish attitude, and the shot being as objected to God as no what else many times. I guess some little needles frightened me. I had seen worse. I once knew a pony who was afraid of balloons. The poor buck fan at the side of a mom building full of the things. Even before any of us realized they were actually just bright bots painted like balloons. Strikingly freaking balloons at that. I shook my head. That was way off topic. Was the clinic really that boring? Considering I wasn't here for myself, and yes, yes it was. The long room before me was made from what was previously a pre-war clothing shop by the look of the dressing rooms at the far end. There was another thing about pre-war ponies I never understood. They didn't wear clothes. So what oh so f fabulous Iquine had the idea to make a dressing room? Wow, this place really was boring enough to bring that to my intention. Even so, the previous pointless stressors had been converted into current covered hospital beds around which sat a whole plethora of medical screens and equipment. Three ponies occupied the beds. Many more beds were backed against the left and right walls between us, where the store shelves had once been. Most were occupied with the slaves we'd rescued. In fact, it had surprised me that another pony in this town was willing to help them. Bone meal, it seemed. Ted had the same caring tendency as his sister, even if it did take a little convincing from the town authority to have him accommodate most of the, of the recovered population. I overlooked that latter part, however, simply wanted to look beyond the Corsian involved to see that there was another good pony out here. After all, he did need at least some cats to get by, so it wasn't too hard because I did the same thing in the matter of speaking no matter how kind-hearted I thought I was. Bone Meal himself was a unicorn bug, boasting a white surgical robe. He wore glasses over his brown coat and white mane and was standing beside the bed closest to me. Cherry was laid nervously atop the old metal frame. Even after last night, it had been a struggle to get her in here. Never mind get her to lay still while Buck was a cold metal utensils did his work. If she had not been so tired, I doubt that I may have persuaded her to do any of this. That in itself didn't make me feel good about myself. Abusing the fact she had failed to get much sleep certainly wasn't the best way to leave an impression, especially considering in the moments in which she did get some rest. It was fleeting and plagued by dramatic night terrors. On top of that, there was my own brief moments of sleep, most of which had also been plagued by similar dreams. It seemed all the talk I had been having with Star, as well as the incident at the Iron Shot factory, had left a grave impression on my restless mind, the likes of which I could not escape even in unconscious. For a long while, I was frightened that somebody would come to investigate Cherry's unconscious cries. Her cocktail didn't seem to care about her waitresses, not to even raise an ear. Not to mention the fact I had had to sneak Cherry out of the back this morning to avoid the bitch. Finally, on top of all that, I was hungry. All I'd been able to eat was some old sugar apple bombs from my bags. Worst of all, I'd not even had a chance to look at my spare energy rifle. I shook my head. This place really was more than enough to make me lose myself entirely. It's all for the better, Dragon, I assured myself. No, it's all for Cherry, I corrected. As for the mare in question, she seemed to be physically fine. Or at least Bone Meal told me she was. I stood up from the old stool that sat at the bedside as Bone Meal looked over a clipboard suspended by his magic. Hmm, I see. He mumbled as I peered over his shoulder to look at the information on the clipboard. So she's okay, right? I asked, looking down at the random medical gibberish on his clipboard. He looked back, staring over his glasses. Well, yes, no infection, internal damage, or signs of conception. He explained in the emotionally detached clinical tone of voice as he levitated the clipboard to the side. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. 
Also, I tried to assure her Cherry she'd be fine. After I brought it up, she began to indeed worry, and I couldn't have been truly sure she was fine. Hearing her from the doctor just banished the doubts of my own reassurances as he laid those fears to rest. Yes, apart from some vaginal bleeding and some pelvic pain, that thing a simple healing potion would fix. She should be fine. He reassured as he finally placed the clipboard down on the medical cabinet filled with the refrigerator cam to his right. Then he turned to Cherry while looking at her thoughtfully. Mental and emotional traumas, on the other hand, may be far more complicated to treat. Though I have no shrink, that shrink might warn that she'll never really recover from the traumas inflicted upon her after she left town. I nodded, significantly un my understanding regarding her his disclaimer about Cherry's mental and emotional health. Goddess, I felt like I was her mother or something. Regardless, I tried not to think about what the raider's abuse might have done to her head. The physical examination and less than simple blood tests had been uncomfortable enough to watch. Especially after what she said to me last night. But she knew Bone Mule and he was no raider. I don't know that he knew that most ponies working in places such as this were out of help, not abuse. Though their help required a significant amount of caps, your medical supplies weren't cheap in the wasteland. A moment later, Bone Mule struck a switch on top of the screens before trying back behind the medical cabinet. Well, physically, all I can advise is some healing stimulus. Restoration potions should do the trick, then she should rest. He advises Sherry cautiously sat up. I turned towards her, smiling kindly. I felt strangely proud of her bravery. Only yesterday, right her happen where the doctor was, yet she did not fault her too much at the examination. I'd like to think she was regaining her trust, if not of other ponies. Then at least, I hoped, that she might place her trust in me and to an extent and boon meal too. That said, the prescription didn't feel completely accurate. Don't get me wrong, I was no medical pony. A healing potion or two may repair her body. There was nothing new to fix her mind. That was going to take far more than just Ken. That was a fact I knew all too well. That realization hit me some time last night. and its conception, I thought the thought had rolled into existence. No brain, I can't. I have sat my th mental thoughts feeling an aching, twinging sensation within my chest. Yeah, that's the old part of my mental mechanism had indeed sparked into life, and it was slowly shading the layers of filthy cobwebs as I once again began to churn out ideas. No, I can't. I mentally protested again, as if that part of me were full begging for a new toy. No matter how much I want to, I couldn't stay here and take care of her for any longer than today. I still had a job to do, and there was no way I was letting Star go into that place alone. At the other side of the bench was the dangerous side of my mental conflict. It didn't have it in me to tell her. I'll take two healing potions then, I told Bone Meal almost subconsciously as I leaned over his counter. Brown Stallion stared at me for a moment. He must look so strange dressed in this Balharn gear while spreading my caps on somebody else for no reason. That would be the reputation of my land of work earned a pony kicking in then, I assumed. If you were a merc, you were in it for the caps and no pony else. I just sighed at the stereotypical thoughts. Just as I did every time I presented with it. It was as if the whole wasteland was against me. I'd taken one of its leading occupations and was using it to break the mercenary stereotype and my habitual mercenary mentality certainly didn't like that for me. Well, you know what, Lysand? Screw you! I mentally shout out at the cursed entity of what this post apocalyptic shot hole for a world. Regardless of my thoughtful stupor, I failed to notice the bone mule as he began calculating the cost, tapping his hoofs upon the pre war cash register. Well, she's one of the slaves, subtracting that. On uh, the cost of a full body analysis and healing potions, and we come to. 120 caps, he concluded, looking up from the cash register. Well, Dragon, you knew it wasn't going to be cheap, my mind told me in the tone that only said I told you so. 
Still, it was a whole lot cheaper than I was suspecting, even if she had been raped and tortured to qualify for the discount. I grumbled at that implication, setting my subtle frustration on it like a pack of hungry ad wolves. But at least it drove my focus away from the irritation regarding the minor expenses as my horn flared, the respective amount of caps swiftly levitating onto the counter. At least it wasn't all of them. I still had a few hundred or so left, not that they would get me much in these parts. Bonemule smiled generously, before sweeping the caps into the register with a hoof. Thank you, he added. And while it was an honest and appreciative enough tone, I like his greedy neighbor across the yard. A moment later, two healing potions placed my caps on the desktop. Well, he was happy and Sherry was safe. That's it. The mare was still nervously twitchy. Not to mention she clung closer to my tail than any other pony I knew ever dared. Thanks, I groaned, trying to be as appreciative as possible. It was a bone meal's fault that I was slowly leaving myself stuck with this mare. Hey, I know it's none of my business. If you want my advice, you should stay around and give her somebody to talk to. She clearly suffered from minor PTSD, talking about as the best treats mints. Especially considering a cocktail usually treat her employees over there. Bumming a whisper, gesturing in the direction of the saloon. Mayor's flattened. Okay, so that part was his fault. But he was right. I wasn't just going to leave her back at cocktails. Even if I knew it would be so much easier to simply move on. Barbara wondered why he would let her go back. Its saloon owner was an abhorrent slave, I mean, pony the town, and I doubt his opinion would make any real impact. I said to myself quietly, no, I couldn't leave her. The lion wouldn't let me without twisting my insides up with guilt. Out there, she wasn't safe, even though she thought she could handle it at, like the last time. Damn it, dragon, was it with you? I cursed myself. But then I just stopped, valuing my plethora of problems. Firstly, I had a job to do. Secondly, I had a mirror I couldn't bring myself to abandon. And third, I had a friend I didn't wish to disappoint. No solutions presented themselves to my mind. Come on, Brain, you frisky little fricker, give me some solutions. I had a home back in Sharon where I could take her. Yes! But the mental mechanism that provided the idea was at least I was shooting it down. I had no time to backtrack. Star could be very patient, but I wasn't doing that to him. Uh, hmm. Bumiel's interjection swiftly shook me from my thoughtful stupor, only for me to realize that all the time I had been just leaning on his counter. Stepping back with a slight hand of embarrassment, I shook my head. I'll keep that in mind, I told him as he looked at me peculiarly. Before he could question Hoffer, I retrieved the potions and trotted out of the door. Cherry darted after me. Her shivering hoof steps unmistakable upon the rickety wooden floor. Feeling any better? I asked the moment we were both outside. For her shy expression, I could tell she was so rather uncomfortable with admitting to me the whole ordeal even happened. Nevertheless, her ears tweaked upwards at the sound of my voice. Yeah, I... thanks. She stuttered in an unmentioned, emotionally monotone tone of voice. Alarm bars were already going off in my mind. I recognized what was once anxiously and swiftly developing into a noticeable depression. Damn it, dragon! You're a mercenary, not some damn psychologist! Yet Bone Mule hadn't been much help in that regard either. Care for somebody to talk to? Yeah, I could do that. Not forever. Not for as long as she needed me to. You could do it right now, my mind started dryly. I sighed. Right, of course. Hey, remember what I said last night? Just trying to think about what makes you happy, I forced. Really, Dragon? That was the best you could come up with. Do you even consider the fact she might be afraid to think about the one thing she told you made her happy? Thank you, Brain. You're such a support friend. Sherry looked up at me. Thanks, but I don't think that will do me much good around. Her sentence trailed off into an uncomfortable silence her eyes leveled at the saloon. Unfortunately, my anger exhibited itself as I ground 
my teeth in anger, my muscles and my limbs flexed and relaxing as I breathed heavily and exercised every ounce of my self-control not to storm about as a town. Capture a raider. I used a potato peeler to release all my hatred and fury for what their treatment of Cherry had done to her. By Celestia, if I could, I'd drag Cocktail out into a raider den and see how she liked to spend a day with them. I'd be a far happier pony. She'd probably feel just a uh, home among the of scum as Mr. Red enjoys using them like chess pawns. To be exploited to the fullest extent and then sacrifice when he no longer needed them, I assumed. That wasn't the point, Brain. Regardless of my vendetta against Cocktail, Cherry still looked terrified of returning to her old place of employment. Furthermore, it seemed she thought she wasn't good enough for that. If I left her here, I'd spend almost every moment resenting myself for plunging her back into that dick guarding and defeat and enhancing environment. Not only that, but I'd be leaving her to suffer alone with the extra mental baggage of being a raider victim. I really hated that long dormant part of my consciousness. How'd you end up there anyway? I asked as casually as possible, dragging my thoughts away from the previous subject as I began to trot across the muddy town yard. She looked slightly shocked that an opponent was interested. Nevertheless, she began to follow me. Then she sighed, her eyes glowering at the dirt. My family were traitors. My mother, father, and sisters were all earth ponies. So it was quite a surprise just when I came along. She smiled in that memory, moving around my, to my side instead of being my shadow. I slowed slightly, focusing my intention on her story. I have some skill when it comes to bartering and for things like guns and other combine relay stuff. My sisters are real good with all the fine little things, locks in particular. My father taught them that even though they were earth ponies, they could get into anything. When we came to teaching me, she trailed off and then proceeded to snicker less slightly. Well, if you are taught how to handle fine things by hoof, then precise levitation only triples those skills. She appeared almost giddy for a fleeing moment at the latter part, like it was some great graduation. I felt strangely happy for her, even if such a talent had obviously been discovered years ago. Picking logs? I had to admit, for all my magical skill and weapon tinkering, log picking was not something on my list of abilities. Not high, anyway. But I'd try anything. <clears throat> so, say I had a safe. Oh, I don't know. Locked in the vault. Could you use your lock picking skills to open it? I asked casually, waving a hoof in the air in a vertical, circular motion like I was turning one of those rotating vault mechanisms. For some odd reason, Griddle's micro-stable came to mind as I asked. Cherry's spark widened, smiling, unable to hide her pride. I've wrecked a few safes before. It would depend on vault door style, its locking mechanism, and the time constraints I'd be working with. So my results will vary depending upon those kinds of factors, she told me, her fluttering again to see her become so vivacious. She was so adorable I could brain no. I said refusing to yield to whatever thought my willful mind drudged up this time. Well, it's not something I can do, I admit. The star asks out to deny it. I added with a playful fake embarrassment. So I can swear the pink mare laughed. I at least raised the hoof to her muzzle and closed her eyes for a second. It's true. Seven years of work work and I have never picked a lock. Oh sure, you've tried. My egotistical mind added swiftly, but I merely showed it away. Cherry was smiling at that was not to sustain that positive set of thoughts. These positive thoughts held back the other less positive thoughts. You've been going on there for seven years? She asked, gesturing to the town gay as I nodded. What's in my life, actually? Across half of the damn wasteland, I added cheerfully. I had announced that our seemingly random walk about the center of town was directing us toward one of the structures at its edge, specifically the weapon store, actually named Ratches after the sales pony I knew who worked there. 
I've been a customer once or twice. For the car events that supply displaced were the same ones which supply churned. The latter gained the better business due to its greater size and population. So I really only ever used Ratchet Store to sell loss, junk and repair, and upgrade my own weapons. Glancing at Cherry, I realized that she'd failed to answer my question as to how she ended up here in the first place. That wasn't something I was going to force her out of her. If she didn't want to tell me, then she didn't have to. Well, there, and we both found ourselves staring at the glass front if I had once been in a cake store. Only where once there had been savory desserts, there were now many varying weapons, ammunition, and spare parts. All of which were locked behind the metal grid that covered the tire glass from the inside. Warning, this establishment is protected by anti-magical charms. All intent to break in will notify the authorities. It was red and faded yellow upon the tired pre-war sticker on the left of the metal grid. I couldn't imagine the warning you had any weight to it anymore. Not that I was going to put it to the test. I was an opportunistic scavenger. That's straight up with that. Thief. Not that any of the stuff in there was worth stealing anyway. Most of it was either broken, overpriced, or not all there at all. Sad they were all boring old bullet flingers. Cherry, however, was looking at the array of guns in a strangely different light. I know. She was looking at the guns, but also something else. I glanced around to see her expression mirrored by dull reflection in the glass. I sat in my own confused double ganger look to her. You okay? I asked carefully as the pink unicorn stared even more into her reflection. She snapped back sharply, before backpedaling slightly. Yeah, yeah, fine. Her words were lost in the sea of stuttering before she finally stopped inside. I... It's just... I saved up a lot for a chance to get out there and when the chance for me to do something came. Luckily, the foreign was a lousy revolver and... Well... She glared back up at the window, her reflection staring back at her with disapproving eyes. And well... You saw where that got me. Before I could even say anything more, she stamped her hoof on the ground weakly. <coughs> Sweet son and sugar key were the only friends I had in that stupid saloon and I let them down. Just like I let every pony else down. Her voice grew slowly weaker and that final confession left her. She had to pay to help ponies? I don't even know why. Guess I only had to pay myself. But for some reason, that made me furious. I could almost imagine the famously voiced entity of the wasteland telling her, Oh yes, dear. You can indeed help your friends. But first I want this, and this, oh and that too. I hated that entity with a fiery passion. So everything from a pony. Even if all of that pony wanted it was help. That's why you don't go around on being a hero, reminded one dozing the flames of my anger noctantly. All that left me physically it was a grumble when then I looked to Cherry and put a hoof. Wait, no. I shouldn't touch her unless I can do so without expecting anything from her. I really shouldn't touch her while I have ulterior motives regarding her. I retracted my foreland and instead lowering my gaze to hers. Good. You're in fine position. Now kiss! Rain? No, just shut up. She was on the verge of crying. The memory of the two mirrors I'd failed to save it could have made coping with Cherry's feelings of failure and uselessness so much easier for her. It was only making me feel worse. Damn it, if I hadn't gone back for Star or if I uh, have freaked about that mare in the alley back then. And you had no support, or any idea of where any pony in the factory was. Screw you, brain, I mentally hissed as the irritatingly rational and logical thought crossed my mind. Hey, Jerry, look, don't blame yourself so much. You're the only pony around here who's brave enough to do something, I assured her comfortingly. She's now seeming to hold back tears. Yeah, and that got why I for being so reckless. She could 
she counts her in a disappointed tone of voice, wiping her nose with a huff. Oh, Celestia, where was the smiling cherry I'd seen just a moment ago? I thought to myself as my heart sank as seeing her hurrying like this. Damn it, dragon! Buck up! You got her there a moment ago. You can do it again. My mind told me firmly. You said you wanted to get out there and make a difference? I asked, hoping dearly that she would not suspect the vague chain of conversation. She looked at me, her expression almost bringing my fears to life. But then she nodded. You think you can? I pressed, trying my words as manageable as possible. Unfortunately, her look turned skeptical. I imagine her recent experiences had dashed her hopes of becoming a pony that could make a difference. I took a step back, raising my head. Expectantly, hers slowly followed. I remember both looking at our reflections in the glass and the guns beyond. You know, I've never met a pony who can pick a lock, and I really find myself on the winning end of a deal. Okay, so that last one wasn't wholly true. I could get most bucks to part with as many casts as I wanted if I tried. Marriage was less so. My attempts were still admirably embarrassing for both parties. Look, Cherry, the point is I'm getting at is that no matter what I'm going else about, this town thinks about what you did. Knowing you did means the whole world to ponies like me, I blurted out. The mere idea that there was somebody out there, excluding myself in Star, which run into a raider den to help somebody else, occupied my much of my thoughts. As I looked back to her, she appeared dumbstruck. Even though an enroaching depression could not hide her shock for long, I had no idea whether it was because I, a big scary mercenary pony, had admitted it, or the fact that I, as a pony who wanted to do right by other ponies, had admitted it. She seemed to have returned to me not depressed and miserable, but curious. I, on the other hand, must have looked in it like a hopeful filly who just found their special talent and was now sure there was nothing standing between me and the fame and fortune said talent would bring. Was I really that wrapped up in this? Saving ponies? I mean, yeah, I was right, but... I didn't want to be a paragon of goddess. I didn't want to be a hero. Cherry sighed. Turn back to the glass and went on pressing a hoof against it. You really mean that? She asked as if desperate for me to say yes. But expecting nothing other than no. I took a breath. Of course. Like I said, it's been a long time since I met a pony who would do what you did. I admitted softly, scuffing my forehoof against the floor. Brain. Wait, no. This was me. I was behaving like this. Guys, now it was like I was coming onto her or something. No, I had to stop. This was not the message I wanted to get across. I just wanted her to be happy and away from the stupid town. I just... Jerry, how good are you with an actual gun? I feel proper thing or not. I saw without adding mention of the revolver she'd brought up. It was because I had a nagging fear that it was the same one which uh, Mr. Red I used to kill her friends and by extension threatened to kill her, and the investment she slaved in that whore house cocktail was running for goddess know how long to make. She glanced down over the array of weapons. Part of her seemed lost in disbelief. The other bore a small head of regret and guilt. Yet most of it was fought back by a firm determination my words had seemingly elided. I have some skill, though it's a bit rusty. I mean, cocktail deal is practice, but I can shoot. Let's see. Rifles, revolvers, obviously. Oh, and I did fire a magical energy weapon once or twice. She said, pointing a hoof to my weapon, lad and barding. I smiled warmly. She was like some little fools, dumbly listing all the reasons they were responsible not to stay home alone or look after some buried pet they dragged home. I looked back to the window with a sigh. My reflection looked back at me, as did those of my many firearms. Damn it, dragon! I cursed myself, looking at the reflection of a white unicorn looking back at me. You better not regret this. 
I looked back to Cherry. Noticing the long pause had caused her to deflate ever so slightly. I was sure my next words would fix that. Jerry, what would you say if... I paused the words catching in my thought. Her ears perked. Damn it. Do not regret this. How would you like to come with me when we leave? For no, level up. New perk added. Quick thinker, level one. Not as quick with your brain as you are on your hooves. Gain five intelligence. Companion added. Tained. Cherry pin. What's tie you one's hoof is only improved by one's horn. Gain five to lockpicking and bartering skills when traveling with this companion.